Explorers, I'm Anna, an educator at the North Carolina Arboretum. If you're new to Eco Explore, welcome aboard. If you've been with us before, we're glad you're tuning in again. For those of you that might be new, you can start by going to ecoexplore.net with your grown up and create a username. From there, you can start taking photos of wildlife and uploading them to your Eco Explore account, where once you submit them, they'll be sent to our Eco Explore processors, who will review them and then give you points that you can put toward earning badges and prizes. Some of your photos will even end up on the iNaturalist network to help real scientists. Now that we've gone over the basics, I want to say thank you to all who participated in botany season. Woo! Remember, you still have until Friday, June 5th to submit all your badge requirements. And now, I'd like to welcome you to a new week, a new season, a new badge, herpetology season. For these next three months, Eco Explorer is diving into the fantastic world of reptiles and amphibians. During the months of June and July, we'll be highlighting additional badges you can earn along with your herpetology badge. But for this week, I want to hang with some herps. Herpetology season is all about reptiles and amphibians. Both of these types of animals are vertebrates, meaning they have backbones. They are cold-blooded, meaning they can't generate their own body heat, so they must warm up from the sun. And they lay eggs. Except reptiles lay hard shelled eggs on land and amphibians lay soft gel eggs in the water. And of course, reptiles have hard scaly skin, whereas amphibians have soft smooth skin. Can you think of any herps? Some of my favorite reptiles are the green sea turtle, a ring neck snake, and a Komodo dragon. Some of my favorite amphibians are a spring peeper, an eastern newt, and a green frog. Next, I want to introduce you to a special guest who studies reptiles and amphibians for his job. I'm going to turn it over to herpetologist and salamander expert, Chris Beachy. Thanks, Anna. Hi, I'm Christopher Beachy. I'm a biologist and a herpetologist, and I teach both of those courses at Southeastern Louisiana University. So, how did I become a herpetologist? When I was a little kid, I remember going out with my father and my brothers in a forest in California, but we scooped up a whole bunch of tadpoles. And we took those tadpoles and we put them in a, a little pumpkin container, you know, like you would use for Halloween candy. And we filled that thing with tadpoles. And I was amazed by those tadpoles. My father didn't call those tadpoles, he called those polywogs. I think that's kind of a pretty cool name for tadpoles. Well, we released them all, but I asked my father if we could keep one. He goes, yeah, sure. So I kept one. I showed it to my first grade teacher, and she said, well, let's keep it in class so everybody can see it turn into a frog. Right away I thought, what, what, what? This is gonna turn into a frog. I had no idea about this thing called metamorphosis where a tadpole turns into a frog. And sure enough, that's what happened to this very cool tadpole. It grew hind legs, and then little by little, those front legs started forming and its head started changing and it became a frog. So that happened when I was about five, about six or seven years old. So I've been studying salamanders especially, but I still study all amphibians, and I have an interest in reptiles as well. But I study salamanders specifically, and I've been extra fascinated in that process called metamorphosis for all this time. It turns out there's a lot that we don't understand about why a tadpole turns into a frog. There are even salamanders that do the same thing. Most salamanders begin their life much like a tadpole, in the water, with gills, and eating food in the water. And then at some point, they transform from an aquatic animal in the water to an animal that is terrestrial. It lives on the land, in the forest. Now one of my favorite things to do as a salamander biologist was when I had a job in North Dakota. I spent years understanding the life of the tiger salamander. It's a very complicated life to understand. I worked really hard to do that, but it was impossible without getting help from a lot of other individuals. Much of the information I gathered on those tiger salamanders came from participating with local schools. In other words, about half of the data that I ever collected was because I had hundreds of citizen scientists helping me. What that means is a little kid in the second or third grade 
would capture a salamander, take a picture of that salamander with his or her phone, and then send that image to me. And so long as there was also a ruler in that picture with that salamander, that was a lot of data that I could use to help understand the life of the tiger salamander. So citizen science has always been very important to me in the work that I've done. Since moving to Louisiana, it's allowed me to get back to North Carolina as often as I can. And why would I do that? Well, you may not know this, but North Carolina is simply the best place in the world for looking for salamanders. It has more species living in different lifestyles than anywhere else on Earth. So there's all these salamanders living in the streams and in the ponds and in the woods of North Carolina. And it's spectacular there. So the next time you dig around in the forest, go ahead and turn over a rock, turn over a log whether or not you're in a stream or in a forest and see what you can find there. Chances are you'll be surprised and there's a lot of salamanders there to see. I get back there as often as I can because it's about the best place to go. So thanks for listening and thanks for hearing my story. Back to you, Anna. Wow, Chris, salamanders are super cool. Thanks. Time to go over the challenges. For the season challenge, your mission is to submit six photos of herps over this three month period. If you don't know quite where to look for herps, it can be a little tricky. Here's some tips and tricks. If you're near a pond, you might find some aquatic turtles sitting on a log in the water, or maybe you'll find a frog sitting at the edge of the water. Or if you're around a rock wall, you may find a lizard soaking up that sun. Remember to not move too quickly and to stay quiet so you don't scare them away. For this week's challenge, your mission is to pick your favorite reptile or amphibian, do a little research, and upload an interesting fact to your Eco Explorer account. For more information on this challenge, you can check out our newsletter or visit ecoexplore.net. And we'll kick off our colors badge next week for the rest of June, so stay tuned. Don't forget to check your email every Monday for our wild weekly newsletter filled with fun activities and member features. Also, tune into Eco Explorer's Facebook Live every weekday at 2 p.m. to see some exploring in action and maybe get a little inspired. Good luck, have fun, keep exploring.